So, hello everyone and welcome to what is now episode five, I've done this five times now, um, of the series that I've now called Valhalla Conversations, where I meet creatives of like-mindedness who likes Vikings, Viking Age and of course Norse mythology because they're the two parts of the same coin which I absolutely adore. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome today on my fifth episode Kate Hartfield, author of this wonderful book. I do encourage everyone to go buy it. I mean just look at that cover. Just look at that lovely cover. Of course ignore the Thor's hammer, it's all about this person right here, this person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we shall dive in tomorrow about that. So Kate, would you like to introduce yourself and your wonderful works? Hello, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, this is a wonderful, a wonderful project. And yeah, I'm just looking forward to the conversation. Uh, so I am a writer who lives in Canada. I live um, just outside of Ottawa. Um, and I have, I used to be a journalist. And I've written um, about five novels that have been published. I say about as if it's like not a discrete number. <laughs> um, so a few novels of my own, uh, including The Valkyrie, the Embroidered Book, which is um, a big novel about Marie Antoinette and her sister. Um, and I have a medieval novel called The Chatelaine. Uh, and I have more novels coming out um, shortly. And I've also mm -hmm. written a couple of tie-in novels for Assassin's Creed, the video mm -hmm. game franchise. Short fiction and interactive fiction. Uh, so all kinds of uh, storytelling in, in different formats. Brilliant. Well, of course, today is specifically about this one, which I only discovered myself last summer due to a secret project that I'm not announcing just yet, dear viewers. It's still being finalised. Um, Kate is one of the privileged few that knows. <laughs> um, but yes, so I, if anyone follows me on Twitter, Instagram, well, what used to be Twitter, Instagram threads, they'll know that I love Norse mythology and particularly Valkyries, hence why I'm surrounded by all the different books and comics featuring Valkyries that I have read followed some brilliant, some okay, most of them are good. I do recommend most of what I have on my bookshelf. But this one, this one went straight to the top of my number one list, Kate, when I finished it. I read it in five days, which as a mum of a toddler, very active mm -hmm. toddler who's three going on 13, was an amazing feat because I haven't read that quickly for some time <laughs> since becoming mm -hmm. a mum. Um, so I guess we'll start off with the beginning and like, how did you get the idea? to write the Valkyrie. Yeah, I, like many books, I think this came from a few different streams all joining together to make a river and, you know, a few different places that uh, were bouncing around in my mind. Um, so probably the, the actual moment when it was born uh, was a night when I was reading bedtime stories to my kid. Uh, he was, I think, about nine years old at the time. He's 14 now. And uh, he loves mythology and, and folklore mm -hmm. and history. And uh, so we kind of share an interest in that kind of thing. And he had several books on his shelf about Norse mythology. Uh, you know, some of them written more for kids, some of them not. And it was probably the Neil Gaiman Norse mythology book that mm -hmm. we were reading. And we came across the story that that book does have a, a short version of the Brynhild and Sigurd story mm. in it. And, uh, you know, we were reading that together and uh, maybe another couple of Norse Smiths that, that week. And I um, I was doing a short fiction contest for a writer's group that I'm a part of called Codex. And mm -hmm. we have this flash fiction contest every year. And it's, uh, the, the idea is to write a, a very short story over a weekend, 750 words over a weekend. And uh, I was inspired to write this very short story about Brunhild from her perspective. Because mm. when I read this story, I thought, uh, when I was reading the myth, I, I had read it before, but it just really struck me that there were things about Brunhild's side of the story that, that didn't ring true to me, that it just didn't make sense. Mm. And I thought, well, I'm just going to write from her perspective. So I wrote the 750 word story. And uh, my co-writers who read it said, oh, well, this is great, but it's it's not a 750 word story. This is a novel. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I had the beginning of the novel from there. Um, and, and that was really the spark of it. But there were some other things then that as I read the research and I started to think about, OK, well, what story do I want to tell? Then it, it grew from there. Hmm. Because, of course, dear viewer and reader, listener, whatever, um, this book is a dual narrative. It's told, of course, from Brynhild. Um, the fallen Valkyrie, the only Valkyrie in, has a real showpiece in legend and lore, um, but it's also told from the point of view of Gudrun, the kind of like unfortunate sister to King Gunnar and the whole love quartet that's 
more complicated than Romeo and Juliet by far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how did you decide to make it a two dual like feminine narrative as well? Yeah, so where I came from with that was um, I, you know, I was immediately drawn to the story of Brunhild because she is, um, you know, she's she's many different things in many different versions of the story. So uh, the the two main streams of sources, source material that that we have are, you know, the Norse mythology, um, the prose eddas, the prose and poetic eddas, mm -hmm. and uh, the Song of the Volsings, and we'll probably get into that. And and mm -hmm. over on the Germanic side, there are several medieval poems, and the best, the biggest one is the is the Nibelungen Lied, which is this big epic poem. Um, some of the names are different, but most of most of the story is pretty much the same. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, with some important changes, which again we can get into. <laughs> um, but so when I, when I was reading all this source material, uh, Brunhild herself, you know, sometimes she's a sorceress, sometimes she's a mm -hmm. witch, sometimes she's a queen over the water. Uh, but uh, in the Norse versions, she's a fallen Valkyrie. And mm -hmm. so I. Um, you know, I, I thought she was a really interesting figure. So that's where I began. I, and I, so I didn't really begin with this idea of the two women talking to each other. But as I started reading uh, to, to research the story, I was really struck by their relationship. And they're often portrayed as, as these bitter rivals that end mm. up um, bringing everything down, uh, bringing on catastrophe because of their jealousy of each other. But when I was reading, um, actually, I've got it right, right here beside me, the Mm -hmm. The Song of the Nibelungs, which is a, a, a translation by Margaret Armour, and this is actually from the, mm. the Tolkien's bookshelf oh, edition. Nice. I was really struck by um, how there there is these phrases about like saying things like when um, when these two women saw each other in the hall, they couldn't take their eyes off each other, and mm. you know when they saw each other, they embraced warmly, and there was just all this 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 sense of a really passionate relationship there, even before they become enemies and rivals. Um, and so eventually it just dawned on me that the easiest way to tell a different version of the story that that made sense and to me even made more sense in some ways than mm. what has come down to us was to wonder what what would the story have looked like to them if they were actually in love. So that's where the, mm. the dual narrative came from with with them being um, and because, uh, you know, who tells the story and who listens to the story mm. is so important in retellings. It was important to me to have them be both the tellers and, and also the audience uh, in a sense mm -hmm. that that this is a contained universe in which they're telling each other the story. Mm. I must admit, kind of like when I first started reading it, the way Brynhild starts referring to her past, but also in the present tense, it was like, okay, well, mm. what's happening? She's like, my beginning, but then my other beginning, I'm like, okay, which, which I'll just carry on and eventually make sense. And of course, by the end, mm. it all does because you realize yeah. it's like one of those films that starts you in the middle and then it takes you back to the mm -hmm. beginning and then it works your way through. And of course, it, yeah. it is really refreshing and of course, highly relevant to kind of like 21st, 22nd, dare I say, century values today about mm. kind of like equality and independent women and that kind of thing about kind of getting against, get, against the hierarchy so to speak um mm -hmm. to have these strong two female voices because of course the legends focus mainly on what the men get up to so it's, it's mm -hmm. Sigurd that goes and kills the dragon it's Sigurd who wakes Brunhild it's Sigurd who woos mm -hmm. her and goes after the treasure and it's Regan who I always found was a really weird mm -hmm. wor wormy type character um oh, wow. he often reminds me of um oh, a character from Harry Potter that I can't remember the name of I want to say Wormwood but I could be wrong <laughs> oh uh yeah um, I know the one you mean, yeah. yeah yes, I, can't remember I, his name I, I remember yeah. him specifically because it was in the Prisoner of Azkaban and he betrays Harry Potter and mm. his newly found uncle and that whole shebang. Mm. It just really came back when I reread the Saga of the Volsungs after, of course, rereading yours. And that's mm. what it really made me notice. And I'm still rereading it as part of my secret project and doing some analysis there, dear listeners, about the changes and adaptations you've introduced. So you've not mm. just told it from a different point of view, but you have restructured events, repositioned characters in different ways. Um, mm. I guess the most significant one for me is the way that you've had um, Brunhild not quite, not be the stereotypical, well, the stereotype that everyone knows of, like the damsel in distress, the damsel in the fire mm -hmm. that you've got to go and kiss mm -hmm. away, but very much alike to Sleeping Beauty. Mm -hmm. The kind of like, 
I know in Wagner he made Odin put her to sleep and put the ring of fire, but in your mm-hmm. book she chose to do that because it was she who mm-hmm. wanted to take on Fafnir, hearing it from the birds, which I actually love. Love the mm-hmm. idea of her learning language from the birds and, of course, learning mm-hmm. it from other Valkyries and Odin, which makes sense because he spoke to ravens, so it mm-hmm. actually connects beautifully with the mythology. Um, but were there any pieces and adaptations that you made that you were a bit unsure of, or you, were you quite confident in going forward and making those changes that you made? I'm trying not to spoil it too much mm-hmm. for dear viewers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, uh, it was always a little bit, you know, I, ha- I felt a strong sense of responsibility um, to the history of the narrative and to all of the storytellers who had gone before me um, and to the ongoing story, you know, that that's this living thing over time and will continue to, to live on long past mm-hmm. me in various forms. Uh, so I did feel some responsibility to that, um, to treat it respectfully, and to do my best to to make a story that felt true and felt like it honored the history of the story. Uh, at the same time, you know, the the sources are all so contradictory and have different versions going on. And so I really felt like there was no single canon version that I could possibly betray in a sense, you know, because mm-hmm. there there are different, um, uh, every, almost every scene scene or, or part of the story uh, is told in slightly different ways, especially in um, the Norse versus the Germanic versions mm-hmm. of it. Uh, and even within particular cultural traditions or language traditions, there are still contradictions and changes in the story. So I had a strong sense that storytellers have been kind of messing with this for, for many years and, and have been introducing things that made sense to them or, or spoke to their moment in time uh, mm-hmm. or how they saw uh, the important themes that they wanted to bring out. So when it came time to, to sort of reinterpret an event in the story and look at it from a different angle and maybe even change the facts uh, mm-hmm. that led up to it, um, I felt like that was almost in a way honoring that tradition because it has been changed and played around with so much that uh, that you know it's not this it's not set in stone or ossified. Uh, it's a living narrative that changes all the time. So that that part of it when um, uh, when Brunhild is is sleeping, you know, she does put herself to sleep, and I was really fascinated with the with the role of sleep in fairy tales, as you say, Sleeping Beauty, you know, this, mm-hmm. this story was probably a source for Sleeping Beauty because it has this, this um, idea of, of pricking the finger on a thorn and, and falling mm-hmm. asleep and being woken by a man who comes along and, and wakes mm-hmm. her up. And uh, as a mom, as you will understand, <laughs> uh, I, I felt very strongly that, you know, sleep is so powerful. And so, uh, you know, it's, the idea that it was a curse for a woman um, seems very prevalent in stories. And, and uh, from the woman's perspective, I thought, you know what, sleep is sleep is where we get our strength. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, I just it seemed to me like if somebody wanted to have, have a spell that would put them to sleep, I thought, well, what about looking at it from the other side and thinking about it as a source of strength rather than a curse? And, and so that's where that came from. Mm. The other thing. Kind of like, and I mentioned it earlier, it was kind of like rereading the saga of the Vol songs that I didn't really notice or realise because I have read it before many years ago and it obviously mm-hmm. I think I walked away just thinking oh Odin he's such a manipulator he makes all the bad mm-hmm. things happen effectively um, we'll get mm-hmm. on to him in another minute because he's yeah. a very another important character underlying all this and I think you've done that brilliantly um, but it was when Sigurd and Brynhild in the side with the Volsungs have that long talk and she's sharing her wisdom about the runes and this that. I thought you've done really well to adapt that all those little verses about using runes and ale and using runes and fire and healing and birchwood and that kind of thing to make it very practical and almost like very believable very physical magic as well like not just like using the runes to kind of like give her that sleep boost to give almost like an adrenaline rush almost Akin to, I don't know, Captain America going into a capsule, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to give it yeah. a modern analogy. Um, yeah. Um, but also, because I've been rereading up to the point where she is with um, Gunnar and Gudrun and their family, and of course, mm-hmm. Sigurd's there, and there's that bitterness simmering away. And of course, Gudrun's mum mm-hmm. asks her to help strengthen the stones and the bridge. And I thought, mm-hmm. oh, that's really interesting. We're kind of like using runes, not just in like a magical, oh, I will heal you of your ailments kind of thing, and I will bring fire forth from out of nowhere, but I'm actually going to make a bridge more stable. I thought that was, that was a really clever twist. Oh, nice. Yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was one of those those places where I think all of the 
you know, sort of background uh, ideas of the story and then my own plot and trying to fit this into the historical narrative, mm-hmm. um, you know, all kind of came together and, and it, it just made sense to me that, um, you know, Bernhild would be involved in kind of strengthening the fortifications of the city. And, you know, mm-hmm. so, so one thing that I have found that many people who are not familiar with the source material don't know is uh, that this is a historical narrative mm. and that it does refer to the actual historical event of um, what we now call Worms, Germany, you know, the city mm. on, on the edge of the Rhine um, at, at, at was then sort of the edge of the, the Roman Empire at the time. And, um, and when Attila and the Huns came over, it was one of the first places that felt, um, felt their wrath and, and ended mm. up um, uh, leading to the exile and, and migration of the Burgundian people into what is now Burgundy, France. Um, so all of that historical part of it, I think, is not very well understood. And so I get a lot mm-hmm. of questions from people like, why did you put this in a real historical setting? And But most, you know, most yeah. of this work material actually does refer to this, this historical event, even if it's somewhat obscured now behind different names and different um, yeah. you know, the fantasy and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that part of it, of the city on the Rhine with a bridge, you know, um, it seemed like it was really central to, uh, you know, what what their concerns would be, you know, how to, how to fortify this city and how to be strong. And so, um, you know, I brought in Bernhild's magic into that, I think, as a way to, to kind of bring it all together into a story mm-hmm. that, w- that would seem to make sense to me. Hmm. Well, I, I really admired it because I've read in various North fantasy books, runes and runic magic being used and it has always been kind of like done as a high fantasy thing kind of like mm-hmm. I'll describe these runes on the floor and the trap will appear and that kind of thing but it's yours seems simple but not like on a mundane level but simple on a very kind of like okay yeah that I can see how that would work kind of makes sense and mm-hmm. of course um as well as Gudrun and Brunhild you've also got Orda Gudrun's mum who is mm-hmm. also a bit of a sorceress of sorts and yeah I like because I, I didn't really wasn't really aware of her character much in the source text of the saga the all songs i've yet to ring the nibelung yeah. need if i can never pronounce yeah. the word <laughs> no me neither yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the one with the nibelungs um, yeah but i remember of her course her key role was almost being the main not the enabler that helped mm-hmm. Gunnar get Brynhild because she was the one that weaves the disguise out of air and magic mm-hmm. to enable Sigurd yeah. to go through the fire because Gunnar wouldn't and Sig- Sigurd's horse wouldn't either even with Gunnar on it which I thought was that mm-hmm. and of course the other thing that I noticed rereading and I'm kind of going all over the place with my questions here so apologies I just so many ideas and so many brilliant adaptations was I do remember at least hearing um, an audio version retelling of the Saga of the Vol songs from the wonderful hosts of that Jorvik Viking thing podcast they got some wonderful mm-hmm. t- Jorvik team members to narrate the whole thing and I remember hearing how Sigurd was goaded by Regan to go, go get a really good horse. And he goes there and an old man wonderfully appears and says, oh, we'll drive them all into the river and see which one still swims. But of course, in your one, Odin, which is, of course it is, dear viewers, Odin, the old man on the road is always Odin. It's not yes, Gandalf, yeah. it's Odin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although Gandalf was probably very much based on Odin. Um, yeah. Tolkien being who he was um, mm-hmm. just says oh this horse belongs to a traitor and he doesn't want to work for the traitor anymore so you can have him and that's how Granny the famous horse of mm-hmm. the name becomes Sigurd's yeah. horse even though he was Brunhild's in your telling so mm-hmm. I kind of like how you really explored and that was the first of many instances that explored the reason why Brunhild is in Midgard the mortal realm to begin with is, mm-hmm. is her disagreement, her feud, her argument of sorts mm-hmm. For various reasons with Odin because in the saga of the Volsung she says oh I kind of like favoured one king I defended the other he killed mm-hmm. mine even though I wanted him to live and we just disagreed mm-hmm. and so I was punished yeah. and sent away and I really like how you explored that a bit more especially kind of like with mm-hmm. Hill's first initial chapter um, and her reflection how she was so faithful and beholden to him as a Valkyrie kind of like she was grateful for the training and the powers and sort of ability and she was mm-hmm. almost hero worshipping him in her loyalty mm-hmm. to degree and then when she learned that just by doing what she's doing she then gets told off in a way for doing it and that's one thing that's always made me drawn I think to the Valkyrie characters in mm-hmm. in that they're kind of like they're free but they're not free mm-hmm. they're not quite under control directly but he very much 
I tried to describe it once as kind of like Odin's using them as kind of like talent recruiters. They go off and recruit talent for the war, mm -hmm. for the war kind of thing. But he always has the last shot. Although in this case, mm -hmm. of course, Brynhild disagree because he taught her to judge them. She's judged them, but then he says mm -hmm. no. So it's a case of kind of like almost knowing when, as certainly as a character and as a woman in any context, to step step and say no. I I believe I'm right mm -hmm. kind of thing. I'm not just going to bow to what you say and of course mm -hmm. when he appears to her within the first few pages and kind of says oh hi how are you doing and she's like mm -hmm. leave me alone <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I really love how you've explored that relationship and it carries on mostly at the beginning and then of course near the end where she realizes a lot of truths about mm -hmm. Odin's manipulation not just of her but of course behind Faf Fafnir because Fafnir mm -hmm. was um in your retelling a, a kind of like a creation of sorts from Odin. Odin enables Fafnir to go from a human to that kind of dragon-esque form because mm -hmm. of course there's the legend of Ottar and Regin and Fafnir and Ottar's hide being covered in gold and that's how the cursed ring of the Nibelun gets involved mm -hmm. which I think is another thing going slightly off topic. Mm -hmm. My brain is just all over. There's so many wonderful things about your book um, that you don't really put a lot of emphasis on the cursed ring. I mean, Fafnir mm -hmm. does mention that there's a curse of sorts. It'll be it'll bring doom. Mm -hmm. It'll bring death. But yeah. he doesn't mention anything specifically. And yet, yeah. those of us who know familiar, at least mm -hmm. vaguely familiar, even with Wagner's kind of version, that like, oh, the ring that Brynhild picks is definitely going to be that one ring. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's all, you know, that was all just in my mind as well, when I was writing and, um, you know, that, uh, as you say, the, the sort of uh, overarching story with Odin, that is probably the biggest change that I brought to the book, I think, you know, and, and it's not really a change in the sense that you're right, it's all drawing on on mm. pieces of the story. But the idea that Odin had this uh, you know, plan for the whole, and I, I'll try not to spoil as well, but like the, the idea that, that this all sort of connects together a little bit more um, was me trying to make, you know, to tell this as a modern story, because, you know, there are parts of the old epics and sagas that, um, you know, there's one set of characters goes and does something and then something else happens later on. And there's not really any necessarily any connection between them, because I think mm. it, it, the older traditions, there was not an expectation that there would be a person could go and have an adventure over here. Same character could go have an adventure over here. But to make it a modern, coherent novel, um, there is that question of, OK, well, how are these things connected or what's, uh, you know, what's the overarching story? So I think I did push push on that a little bit I, I did draw inspiration from real mm. stories about what was happening with Odin and Brynhild but I sort of put it all together in a way mm. <laughs> so that's probably the biggest change and and the other big change as you mentioned I think um is that I do not emphasize the ring very much um mm. you know it's kind of there as a you know if you know the story mm. you're going to recognize it but um mm. the uh you know I think partly because I just felt like that aspect of it was so explored um, both by the Wagner opera and mm -hmm. um, and also because the way that most people are familiar with the story, I think, or one way that, that a lot of people are familiar with the story is through Tolkien, you know, because mm -hmm. Tolkien did draw on this source material. Uh, and so the idea of a cursed ring um, mm -hmm. associated with a dragon, you know, I think mm -hmm. we already we already kind of have a story about that in our heads. And so mm -hmm. it's, I it would have been a real challenge, I think, to tell a different story about that for me. And so mm. I wanted to just shift it a little bit and say, well, look over here at this part of it instead. Mm. Well, I the other thing that I really liked, um, and I'm going to trying to think about how not to spoil things, in is that in, in one scene further on in the book, in the, in the narrative that you've told, you've really embraced kind of like Brynhild's past life as a Valkyrie in the Valkyrie. Mm -hmm. I keep saying it wrong. I keep pronouncing the I too much. <laughs> Valkyrie, oh, I don't know. I will yeah. get it right. <laughs> um, erased her past and brought that on in various ways. Like, for instance, um, there is a chance meeting with Loki, which again, you've depicted as a, a feminine form, which for many of us now familiar with the Tom Hiddleston version of Loki and that whole cinematic universe spin-off, mm -hmm. it's quite aware that he is a shapeshifter and very much gender fluid and he mm -hmm. is a very wonderfully interesting character. And although he's got a very brief, I say he, she, they, they have a very brief 
brief appearance, the dialogue was really interesting. So I, I remember reading just before I came on to do this interview that kind of like that conversation where Brynhild says, like, it sounds like you're giving me a warning and that's not mm -hmm. usual for a god of mischief. And he goes, ah, oh, well, well, I keep saying he. They say, well, mm -hmm. warnings are the best source of mischief because mm -hmm. you can either interpret them one way or the other or you don't know what, what the warning is about or about the timing kind of thing. And then, of course, you've broadened it a little bit further in that there's a conflict in the background of sorts between Odin and Freya. And mm -hmm. then your brilliant expanding, expanded en ending of sorts, like an alternative ending to the Saga of the Volsungs yeah. that should have been there that wasn't, which I like. <laughs> I really liked that bit. Um, was kind of like after Brynhild puts herself on the pyre and, and burns. Mm -hmm. And and that's, for me, as as a fan of anything to do with Valkyries was absolutely mind-blowing how you really then explored the mechanics and the role and the duty and the almost weight of responsibility to juggling power of respect for the dead or the dying because mm -hmm. they choose the mm -hmm. dead and then they die mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't yeah. choose from the dead um and then of course kind of like answering to Odin and knowing how to keep a balance of where people go because I'm going to say it just because it because Odin is an underriding force for a lot of the conflicts building and building building and building both kind mm -hmm. of like on a personal level to a kind of continental level aka mm -hmm. the Hun and all that jazz so to mm -hmm. speak um mm -hmm. which really reflects Odin's character so well because so many times he's come up in modern media he's just not depicted I think as the knowledge hungry and power crazed and almost like war starved god that he is because he's always paranoid about Ragnarok and mm -hmm. I love how there was a line quite near the beginning mm -hmm. where I think kind of like can I oh what do you dream about Odin because oh I dream about people taking away my power <laughs> kind of thing mm -hmm. that's a brilliant red light like oh he is he's got that underlying paranoia there he's very much a control freak like mm -hmm. wants it all for himself and I know I'm just rambling <laughs> I, I do have questions in here somewhere <laughs> it's all good <laughs> Um, but mm -hmm. you, of course, explore kind of like not just like the balance of power because Freya is certainly a powerful female entity in Northology because, of course, she brings um, the cedar magic, the cedar magic mm -hmm. um, that Odin then, of course, pilfers because he's just pilfering knowledge here left and centre. Um, but, of course, mm -hmm. the often overlooked and unheard of spiritual role of Dysir versus mm -hmm. Valkyries because... I've read about Dissir in various non-fiction books as being alternative female spirits and how they're sometimes around to almost be like the fairy godmother to kind of guide people to the good path or try and stay away from the bad path. But I like how you set them up as very much, because often Freya is depicted as like the goddess of the Valkyries, but of course they mm -hmm. answer to Odin, not to Freya, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though Freya canonically does select half the dead to go to her hole in Falkbank. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah. that's a really interesting balance you've explored and I would love to know your thoughts on how and why mm -hmm. you did write what you did. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was, yeah, it was a real challenge for me to to decide how to incorporate that Norse mythology and um, especially because, uh, you know, people's knowledge of Norse mythology today, I think, is going to be uh, bits and pieces you know as, mm -hmm. as why wouldn't it be uh, you know little parts of it that are better known than others um, you know I mean the Marvel Cinematic Universe mm -hmm. has has uh, has I think introduced a lot of characters in slightly different forms in different ways which I, mm -hmm. I love but um, but it does sort of create a um, an entry for people that are going to be having those particular characters in mind mm -hmm. uh, and then coming into the uh, original mythology it might actually seem sort of unfamiliar you know so mm -hmm. uh so I thought a lot about how to incorporate that and uh and I was really taken with the um duality or the binary between uh Freya and Odin and uh the Aesir and the Vanir this this mm -hmm. idea that there are these two groups of gods that uh that had um warred and fought and there was a truce and there were some deals and bargains and magic mm -hmm. was all part of the bargain and everything else uh so none of that really gets um explained completely in my novel because it's not really about that but that, that's mm -hmm. sort of the backdrop uh that there are these uh power dynamics happening with the gods themselves and and that explains some of their behavior um so i think that for people who know that that um you know the mythology in, in more detail uh, they can understand what's happening there and i hope that readers who don't 
will at least you know get this sense of what of what the some of the relationships are and I tried to just put them mm. on the page that um and these are you know different these are my versions of Freya and Odin you know like mm. they're they're always going to be every interpretation is going to be different um but I really did love that um that idea uh and it was a challenge too you know I, I did want to have um I needed to have the afterlife present in some sense mm. in this book because um, you know, this is such a big part of what what Valkyries do, as you say, it's mm. it's, uh, it's central to them. But I had, you know, I had to think about how am I going to interpret this for a modern audience and and explain the concept of the the multiple afterlives and and how does that make sense in a novel in which you've got mm. it's it's set in the real world where you will have, you know, Christians and Jews yeah. and uh, you know not Muslims yet, but you know like. Mm. A, all Zoroastrians and you know different uh, different uh, faith systems, including mm. um, old versions of what we would now think of as a sort of Viking belief happening as well in Europe, and and how to be respectful of all of that. Anyway, so now I'm rambling, but yeah, it, <laughs> no, it, 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 real. This, this, this all sort of went into this too, you know, and, and, and I thought of okay, well, how am I going to uh, make an afterlife uh, in this novel that uh, makes sense with all of that and um, and feels like it could uh, be integrated into into the real world in some way, but also um, honors the stories that that this comes from. Um, so I really loved. I, I, it was just one of my favorite parts of the book was was writing uh, the realm of uh, hell and the realm of, mm. of Freya. Um, and this, I, you know, because they're not as well known as the male dominated afterlife yes. of, uh, of Valhalla. Mm. Mm-hmm. yeah I really like that and of course it it made me have a light light bulb I thought oh yeah kind of like because in your book you depict that Brynhild became a Valkyrie through some sort of human sacrifice when she was a little girl um and mm-hmm. I quite liked the, the like the image you picked of Odin taking her hand and leading her off and then six years mm-hmm. later she's a train and fled Valkyrie it's mm-hmm. it's it's it instantly made me think for some reason of I think I think it's on Netflix of the Echo series that Marvel's done with Kingpin having that little girl come under thing. I haven't seen it, so I don't know anything about that kind of comic thing, but it just it just made me think of that particular scene. Um, mm-hmm. But of course, then she's technically dead already. So then mm-hmm. when she comes back to mortal life, yes, she's kind of like living again. But then mm-hmm. the biggest, and I think the most delightful twist is that in your telling, retelling, I should say, you've not just have Sigurd bathed in Fafnir's blood, but you've also mm-hmm. had Brynhild do it simply because they were both together when they killed Fafnir mm-hmm. and Sigurd is the one that I'm much like, oh, look, I can stab my hand and nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just love I like how he just remarks upon that after she's just woken up from her own ordeal of the battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and the scene, the, it's a very visceral scene you describe of her bathing. And I thought that was, mm-hmm. yeah, it made my stomach churn for yeah. her. <laughs> yeah it's gross it's gross yeah Um, but then of course they're kind of like they're immortal or at least can't be killed by blade so to speak unless Mm -hmm. apart from Sigurd of course with his one spot behind his shoulder which Mm. I always thought was a leaf partly because I grew up watching the Sword of Xanten film adaptation I don't know if you've seen the Sword of Xanten before no I haven't no, oh, yeah. I will have to ping you over the details. It should be out there on yes. DVD somewhere. It's been out for a good ten years or so, um, mm-hmm. but that's a really nice film adaptation of the Saga of the Volsungs from the Nibble Long Beard mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And it's a leaf that yeah. falls on his shoulder, and that's what stops yeah. that spot getting put protected by the magic of Fafnir's blood. But in the battle, mm-hmm. it's Brynhild because she pushes him out of the way before he gets jumped, as he usually does. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying not to I can, I can write, I'll speak about Sigurd no I'll speak about Sigurd in a minute what was I was trying to say was um about how of course in the canonical story Brynhild does kind of throw herself on the pyre um with Sigurd mm-hmm. but in this case they have two separate pyres and I wasn't mm-hmm. sure and I'm sure you can correct me on this um because I haven't quite reread the full ending yet but I remember when Sigurd first tasted Fafnir's heart's blood, but he remarks, oh, it hurts, but it doesn't burn. So then I'm like, OK, well, how do you burn their bodies then if they're also fireproof? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and thus yeah. I wasn't sure how Brynhild was able to die for a second time in, in mm-hmm. the pyre because she wasn't burning. But I know, obviously, you can die from smoke inhalation, but I don't know if that's yeah. what killed I'm if, sorry if I'm thinking that too practically <laughs> no no it's it, absolutely I had the same the same uh, thought process yeah so his uh you know there's a little bit of ambiguity I think in mm. in my telling of the story in terms of 
Brunhold's status, you know, as mm. whether she's completely mortal or not. And she's um, at the beginning of the book, you know, she's she's quite clear that, you know, Odin has made her a woman again. And mm. she always was, you know, like my my sort of hand wavy approach to what the Valkyries are like, as, I, as you say, I've decided that they started as humans um, in my particular version of them. And uh, and they just don't age because they're usually in Valhalla mm -hmm. and uh, they they live very very long times but they they still age a little bit, um, and uh, so she's she is just a mortal in my conception of her but um, she does bathe in Fafnir's blood which confers this uh, invulnerability mm -hmm. to her skin and maybe she's got like a little bit of extra something special you know because she used to be a Valkyrie so she does manage to survive this fall. Um, but it's surviving in a very strange and mythic way because she does go to the underworld, right? So mm. it's, it's, uh, she's, it's sort of half and half. And when she, when she gets there, hell says, you know, like what's going on, Some, something's odd about you that you're not, yes. you're not quite living, quite, not quite dead. Um, so, and I think I, I was partly, you know, partly just trying to sort of make sense of the stories in the source material themselves, you know, because as you say, she does, she does go on to a pyre in, in the story and then uh, being, being a mythological tale, there's then these uh, other things like there's um, um, a poem called the hell ride of Brunhild, which explains, uh, talks about her going down uh, into the underworld. Um, and uh, you know, there are, there are, aspects of the story that continue even after death uh, and so I needed to sort of find a way to um, to tell that and still have her be embodied in some way in a kind of mm. modern conception like you know because the questions of like well is she living or is she dead I think mm. we're you know every society will will think about that in, in different ways um, so that's that's sort of where I was coming from there in terms of how can um, you know, how can we uh, have this moment feel real and feel embodied and corporeal, but also uh, draw on some of these sort of mythic stories about afterlives and mm. um, and impossible uh, impossible happenings. Um, and it's I think one of the things that inspired that to some degree as well um, is the novel uh, The Hero in the Crown. Have you ever read that one? It's, no, uh, I've heard that um, one. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it has nothing to do with Norse mythology, but um, it's a, a, a novel by Robin McKinley that was really influential when I was growing up on, on me, and I've read it many times, and it is about a dragon slayer. It's, a, it's about a female mm. dragon slayer, um, and so I think that novel inspired a lot of how I conceived of Fafnir, mm. um, but also I think just in general, it was always in the back of my mind, and the character in The Hero and the Crown um also has a kind of ambiguous relationship with mortality by the end of it <laughs> okay. so you know she, she bathes in a lake and it's like you know she she's not quite human at the end but she she mostly is mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that idea of you know there there's some sort of magic happening that we're not it's not quite making sense um mm -hmm. that was always really appealing to me uh, and that probably came in part from from the hero and the crown as well mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That is really interesting to hear because it's made me think back to because I was reading just before we both came online um, the scene where Gudrun is in the tent with Brynhild. I'm not going to say location or place in the story, but they're in a tent. And Gudrun yeah. is quite innocently and charmingly asking Brynhild questions about the afterlife in Valhalla. And Brynhild's trying to mm -hmm. explain it's not the body we take, it's kind of like the brain, because as Odin told her, it's the brain that distinguishes a warrior from a murderer, kind of like you take the imprint of the world on the mind or the mind of the world and that's what we take up and mm. reading that certainly made me reflect to kind of like my own experience and dabbling with Assassin's Creed Valhalla which you may mm -hmm. or may not be aware of from your fictional mm -hmm. work with them um, because I happily played through their discovery tour of the Viking Age and mm -hmm. they follow a particular character that ends up in Jotunheim because he gets killed but he can't remember why and he speaks to an NPC character outside Mimi as well. He goes, oh, I've given up my auger. I've given up my auger. I can't go back now. And he told me I'd find out who what, who was the guy who did the dad dealing. And it was like, it was an in interesting aspect of certainly Norse culture or the way the Norse, and I'm speaking across broadly Scandinavia here, mm -hmm. as well as Iceland, um, kind of like viewed 
parts of themselves as like not just a body and a soul but all like four different elements I think they had and I thought that was a really nice reflection of that of you having Brunhill try and explain that to Gudrun because oh, wow. there's I certainly wouldn't be able to explain it any better either. <laughs> yeah. yeah that was that was one of the challenges for me and I think actually that was something that I worked on in later drafts because when I um when I had given an early draft of this to my agent uh one of her comments was you know I'm not, I'm not quite get, getting how the afterlife works here can you you know mm. what the what the sort of cosmology is behind this and and why you know why do characters believe what they believe and that kind of thing um and I can't remember exactly what I had in the early draft but uh it was not I was never quite comfortable with it I, I was struggling mm. with trying to figure out how to translate those older ideas about the self you know mm. um into a modern concept I think because we do have um you know those of us uh reading it now from a European or you know European colonial uh, mm. uh mindset are coming from a long long history of understanding death and the soul in a certain mm. way you know if, even if, if one is not religious you know we're we're um just totally affected by and, and sort of swimming mm. in a long culture that, that, that was affected by those ideas of the soul in several uh, world religions. Um, but as you say, the there are some concepts of the self and the afterlife uh, that come through from from old texts that are quite different. Mm. Um, so yeah, so I eventually I just um, I thought well this relationship between Gudrun and and Brunhild will be a good way to explore that question because they do actually come from two different cultures within the story. Mm. Um, and um, and that gives me a chance to for uh, Brunhild to talk about the different ways that that the afterlife pulls pieces of the self self, and so you can have mm. in a single uh, in a single conception of uh, what it means to be a human. You can have stories that have ghosts and have sort mm. of almost zombie like revenant creatures, mm. and you can also have Valhalla, and you can have Folkvang and Hell, and there's an there's an undersea underworld as well, and and all of this makes. <laughs> sense you know so that really was a challenge but I was I was quite proud by the end of it that I felt I had uh explained all of that in a way without you know needing to say well let's have a long lecture now but you know about Plato's conception of the soul or something but uh mm. you know uh it did sort of integrate itself into the novel and um I felt like it needed to to be part of it for uh, for their understanding of what the afterlife was to come through to a modern reader but it was it was tough to get there for sure um going back to I guess the original question about where this all began so of course you would experiencing or exploring Norse mythology through your son but did you have an interest in it before your son also had an interest or was it just did it just spark at the same time as your son was learning more yeah, um, I always have been interested in it. I've been interested in mythology in general, you know, since I was a kid. And, um, you know, I remember reading Edith Hamilton books about mythology and uh, just storytelling um, and, and coming to it, I think, through modern versions of it uh, to some extent as well. And, and because of mm -hmm. Tolkien, you know, Tolkien was was so inspired by this story. He read uh uh, a version of the the uh, Sigurd the dragon slayer uh, story in the red fairy book when he was a child and um, mm -hmm. you know and that was one of his formative experiences uh, so that story was always with him uh, and of course then Tolkien was was really formative for me I read the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. when I was a young teen and have read it many times since and it was always always there for mm -hmm. me in the back of my mind and, and the love of runes from mm -hmm. from Tolkien and um, so yes yeah, so I've always been interested in it and sort of indirect uh fashion as well mm -hmm. well and have you read any in particular any kind of like norse mythological retellings or authors that you might recommend or books that you would recommend um hmm, that's a good question that's one of those questions where as soon as i get off the call i'm going to think about three things that i should have mentioned <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, I know you've yeah. mentioned Neil Gaiman's retelling of Norse yeah. myths, which I also absolutely loved. And then I went and listened to an audible, which he self narrates, which is even better. So I kind of like loved oh, it. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Much. Yeah, no, he's brilliant. Um, I'm trying to think. This one is not exactly um, exactly Norse mythology, but one of my favorite uh, recent sort of um, 
historical looks at, at, at this sort of culture um, mm -hmm. is a book called All the Horses of Iceland by uh, mm -hmm. Sarah, I want to say Toomey, something like that. Um, which is a very short book, and it's it's a histor it's a narrative sort of grounded in a history about um, a person who travels from Iceland uh, during the Middle Ages into Europe. Um, but it's really informed by a lot of folklore and uh, storytelling mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that's the first one that springs to mind. In terms of retellings, um, yeah, I know that there's something that is just in the in the back of my mind that I want to mention. So if it comes up to me as we're talking, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll say, oh, this is what it is. But yeah, there's, there's been a lot of really wonderful, um, um, you know, just illustrated mm -hmm. books about about the myths and that kind of thing coming out in the last 10 years or so. And uh, it seems like every time I go into the store, I see another beautiful illustrated mm -hmm. mythology edition. So it's wonderful to see. And it, it's such an explosion of uh, of retellings in general right now as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Beautiful. Well, that leads me on to my next question, because I was going to ask kind of like, how do you feel about seeing I mean, I guess you could say kind of like more wider different mythology, but it's a particular Norse mythology and just Vikings in general as the broad umbrella term that they now are. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to mention horned helmets. No, horned helmets. Um, <laughs> yes. um, kind of like has just had a huge surge in the last 10 years or so, because they have mm -hmm. always been around, certainly kind of like where I come from, of course, in Britain, it's part of our history mm -hmm. and heritage and culture. And it's always on the syllabus at some point in some year at some school, college. And I do mm -hmm. wish I could go back and study it properly and do history all the way through from GCSE, but English, I went down the English route instead. So here I am just talking about it instead of doing lots of rereadings. But I, I always <laughs> try and I'm always curious to see how people feel as it's a good thing, whether the whether modern interpretations are doing anything wrong or misleading audiences or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great thing. You know, I think there are it is such an elastic kind of uh storytelling um uh network i guess you could say like the, the network of stories is is uh is very resilient and i think you know you can't really wreck it <laughs> you know it, it's it's uh, it's been there long before we were around and it'll be here long after us and i think that um you know it's wonderful to see different uh different interpretations coming in and uh you know feminist and queer interpretations of the mm. stories um you know which which are you know not as you mentioned you know that there's plenty there's plenty of scope there's always been uh gender fluidity and, and mm. different concepts of sexuality and that kind of thing in Norse, Norse mythology so um it's not so much a, a placing of those ideas on old stories but a, a kind of discovering mm. of, of different historical traditions and and how they can speak to us today um so I think it is really rich in um uh in material that we can use to explore what it means to be a person alive in our time and um and at the same time uh you know one of the things that i was really conscious of when i was working on this book is that um the uh the germanic side of it um you know the sort of the the, the side that was explored by by wagner and, and others um was really appealing to the Nazis, right? And mm -hmm. um, the idea of of Siegfried as this, or Sigurd or Siegfried as mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, perfect Aryan hero, um, was a version that that was their interpretation and uh, how they used the story for their own ends. Um, so I think that's part of it as well. And I think taking the story then and and reimagining it and and uh, pulling it out of that context. Um, mm -hmm. and, and confronting it in that context as well and saying, okay, well, what does it mean to be a hero and, and how can we look at stories of heroes and understand how they've been used and abused and misused over the years? Um, mm -hmm. That's all part of the tradition as well. So, um, yeah, so I think it is really useful for every generation to come up with their own look at old stories and, uh, and the, the whole tradition of that story as well. Mm. That's just made me think about... Of course, the character of Sigurd, who we haven't really touched much on, because of course he is mm -hmm. there, but he doesn't have the same spotlight as the vast array of other feminine characters, of course, including Loki, that you've got. And mm -hmm. I remember I quite quickly became to dislike him. <laughs> yeah. And I do yes. hope that was the intention, because I think it was the way yeah. he treated Brunhild after they both killed mm -hmm. the dragon, and he decided he was just going to go off on his own. Um, of yeah. course, partly because he through taking in the blood of Fafnir's heart, absorbed the knowledge that 
Brynhild had of talking with the birds and learned, oh, the birds are bad mouthing about Regan and how he's going to get mm-hmm. got and, and that kind of thing. And how well you kind of explored his character having almost a real, I want to say ego crisis, but it's almost like a self-esteem crisis and that he so badly wants mm-hmm. to be the hero because he wanted to prove himself mm-hmm. to Regan, but now he doesn't mm-hmm. want to go near Regan because Regan's apparently a threat. So now he's got to show himself mm-hmm. to the world around Mm -hmm. and how he instantly identifies Brunhild as like his weakness as Achilles heel because he doesn't want Mm -hmm. anyone to know that she helped him and why he became so outraged that he learned that she was a Valkyrie because oh well you you effectively cheated then because you're a superhero and you could have killed it already you didn't need me and that Mm -hmm. kind of thing I thought that is a really interesting take because of course in the saga of all songs um he's he doesn't have a lot of character so we just make making mm-hmm. a particular saga he just comes yeah. out across the, like the typical kind of quite self-confident um guy that will just kind of like happily save a damsel take all the wisdom mm-hmm. and say okay i'm gonna marry you now and then, then that's it yeah. Really. yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah and it's, it's funny because uh um i was talking about this book with a book club last week and there was this th- oh, I, everyone said oh i hate sigurd you know <laughs> <laughs> really just like sigurd. I'm like, well, <laughs> so it, you're not the only one and and definitely he's you know um one of the things i i did want to do was uh flip around the idea mm. of of this lone uh masculine hero um and uh, you know one of the things i think it's interesting about that is that most of the uh, moments in, in his story are not actually that different in my novel than, you know, in, in the source material. I mean, there are different okay. interpretations and different mm-hmm. things, but if you think about like, well, yeah, he does trick Brynhild in, in the story mm-hmm. and he does leave her and he does, you know, um, as you say, he sort of just marches along and says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'm the hero and this is what I do. And mm-hmm. uh, so, uh but looking at it from her perspective, uh, and also, I mean, I, and I did it, interpret things differently and think about mm. motivations and that kind of thing differently. Um, but it did feel to me like um, you could tell the story and and the events would be pretty much the same. Uh, but depending on how you look at it, um, either he's, um, you know, this this wonderful heroic mm. figure, or he is someone who is just uh, unable to accept um you know that that he's not or that that you know he's not perfect and that he's not he you know he's he's sort of the unearned golden boy and uh, mm. sort of the epitome of privilege in some sense you know even though he he doesn't come from a privileged background but he has this idea that he is the chosen one and he's the one who's going to to save the day um so it was very much a kind of deliberate uh subversion of the idea of the chosen one hero um and uh, poor Sigurd kind of gets the the brunt of that in, in my mm-hmm. telling. Uh, I do feel a little bit badly for him because I think he is uh, being manipulated, and mm-hmm. uh, but it, it's his own choice to kind of go along with that in the end. You know, he has he has agency. He has the ability to not be that guy, uh, mm-hmm. and he doesn't he doesn't take the chance. He just you know he says no. I, this is you know he can't he can't see himself any other way, and and eventually yeah. he just sort of goes down that path. It does, and it really ramps up towards the end of kind of like of his climactic um, canonical death and end scene. And of course, it's only mm-hmm. in your expanded ending where kind of Brynhild finds him in hell and also kind of meets the disseared Freya that she kind of mm-hmm. then learns that kind of like Odin was the one whispering all these suggestions, encouragements, misdirections. And I love how Odin is definitely a master of misdirection. I mean, even at the start mm-hmm. when Brintel says, okay, then tell me where to go if you are the all lone one. He goes, well, you can go left or you can go right. He goes, well, either way, I'm following what you want. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. do, I'm not doing it myself. And it, mm-hmm. I think that really reflected how Odin's present is throughout kind of the entire Volsung line from before Sigurd's time all the way through to kind of like his and Gudrun's end and that kind of thing is he's mm. always in the background pulling the strings. He's almost like more, he's more trickstery than Loki is. Mm-hmm. And speaking of Loki, there was one question that did have firmly in my mind. Of course, with a scene that Loki's in, um, mm-hmm. love to see more of that one. So if you ever want to do a Loki-less novel, please do. Just yeah. saying. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Loki's definitely the flavour of the month, if not the century. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He mentions how, he, well, they mention how they're being used as kind of like a faint in misdirection. They've been sent to thieve something by Odin. Mm-hmm. Asked, I think, well, what, what is Loki thieving from Freya? Because I thought... Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of all the myths that Loki thieves things. 
and mm -hmm. the only thing I think of is something to do with her cloak but in the myths that I know mm -hmm. of he didn't exactly steal it he asked she was a bit reluctant and then she gives it to him and I think mm -hmm. it's mainly to do with the myth of Sif's hair getting lost and how he has to go fly off and speak to the mm -hmm. dwarf so I didn't know if you could maybe kind of like fill in that little that little hole that my brain is eager to know kind of like what was Loki doing <laughs> yes yeah yeah no I wonder if I'm going to be able to because uh, I'll have to think <laughs> back. so one of the one of the things that I was referencing there was um what is it called the Rizingaman which is the her, her mm. necklace you know I so Freya wonder. has a necklace yeah so um but I can't recall how I wrote it now whether I decided that Loki was actually you know, going to steal it at that moment or had stolen mm. it before and there was a reference to it. Um, so, but there, there is this, um, there is this sort of pattern of, um, you know, of uh, some of the other gods going and bothering Freya <laughs> about <laughs> things, you know, mm. uh, that her necklace at one point. And um, there's that story, I'm trying to remember the exact, isn't, there's, Freya's involved in this, there's a story where, um, you know, Thor and Loki, both dress up as women and Thor is the yes the lay of Thrym yeah. that's my favorite one that is right, my favorite right. one yeah, yes I'm yeah. pretty sure Loki asks if they can borrow Freya's necklace and she says no unequivocally right. no <laughs> right exactly exactly yeah so I don't think there was any particular item that I thought that Loki was going to steal if I'm remembering my own thought process correctly don't worry um, I know it's probably <laughs> thrilling to, to yes, take your memory but, somewhere yeah but it was it was sort of that pattern of it seems mm. like these guys are always going to bug her about something or to trick her or something like that and I thought okay well mm. um this will be some one one of those adventures mm. so going back then to Freya kind of like what was your thought process behind involving the Desir and having them be under her kind of like mm. not I say control but certainly almost command influence to and certainly in a more amicable atmosphere from what we see in the book yeah. to the way the Valkyries are under Odin where it's very almost like a military boot camp mm -hmm. but with right, the kind of like the, they train the horses to fly which I absolutely love <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah so I yeah, as you say, the Dizier are not, um, they're not as well known, I think, mm. especially to sort of an Anglophone audience today. It's, its they're not, uh, um, we don't have this sort of mental image of them the way that we do with the Valkyries. Mm. And um, so one possibility for me was, you know, I, I, I thought, well, I could try to make them really similar to the Valkyries, but um, I think they do come from a slightly different folkloric strand you know mm -hmm. like they they have this this um association of being kind of uh spirits in a, mm -hmm. in a bigger sense rather than the shield maidens you know of, mm -hmm. of the valkyries um so even though they're doing a similar function especially in the interpretation that i've used here in the book they're um they're not exactly the same you know they're not they're not exactly the same sort of being uh, so i was really a kind of thought a lot about how to have this other set of female um, choosers of the dead um, mm. and you know how would they be different from the Valkyries but how would they mm. also kind of they must have a relationship with them in some way um, so they were a chance to create almost a kind of foil and say well you know what Odin has created here is not uh, somehow uh, inevitable you know that he made choices for how he was going to deal with this this system um, mm. of of the dead and and also I was really um, intrigued by the concept which you know I didn't invent of of as you say that that the um, half of the dead in in mm. battle would go to Folkvang and half of them would go to Valhalla and uh, this sort of almost bureau bureaucratic system mm. of you know well, how do you choose which half you know <laughs> like and, and how how does that all work out in practice you know it, it's mm. just it just seems. Um, Sort of almost more symbolic than practical um so trying to figure out how that would look on the battlefield um mm. was a real challenge and, and something that i felt like i had some scope to kind of invent a little bit there mm. yeah i i really really enjoyed it because i've only been vaguely aware of them through my non-fiction reading but mm -hmm. i certainly it made more sense than have imagining kind of like freya having loyalties to half the Valkyries or having kind of like having mm -hmm. having to go to Odin to get her half and like she then takes her half in her own right with mm -hmm. her own crew of 
undead mm-hmm. talent seekers so to, so, mm-hmm. so to speak um yeah and I think the okay, of course the trying not to spoil any too much but the way you've got you have Brunhild kind of like after her death in the canonical legend come back and actually confront Odin and challenge Odin even further so like she charged in the beginning and she got banished and then she mm-hmm. died because he she got tangled up in his own further machinations and then she still mm-hmm. kind of like goes like no I'm I'm gonna get my own allies and she does amazingly they're all again females she speaks to hell she speaks to Fraser 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 even when I can speak mm-hmm. English or even Norse um and she together they do kind of almost set up a kind of a trap to get Odin to appear and actually kind of like so oh, look, well, look we know what you're doing we know you've done this mm-hmm. we know you've done that and like can you just stop now because mm-hmm. obviously his manipulation of characters in the book and within the history kind of not just the mythological characters but the historical ones to generate even mm-hmm. bigger wars and more wars which I think you've again done really brilliantly to reflect how that impacts on the Valkyries as almost as a workforce mm-hmm. and that they then become overworked and they kind of like go blood mm-hmm. frenzy and crazy and then they don't care anymore about who is dead or alive they're just going to have have fun because mm-hmm. it's chaos and that's all they can do to to survive it yeah. really um it did strain made my mind have a strange parallel to um in in British history when women started fighting in factories for better rights and better pay compared to men when they're all in the same factories and how they ended up having to stand their ground say look we do exactly the same job so you need to pay us all more and it Mm -hmm. made me think back to that and how it is literally a group of women the Valkyries Freya hell in her own way and of Mm -hmm. course Gudrun kind of like serendipitously finds the same moment and the same scene um later on and they all kind of like do get Odin almost kind of like miss well Gudrun in particular gives him mm-hmm. that bit of information that lures him off and he kind of like settles things oh I did I did love I love everything as you can tell in my book I probably said the word love more than anything else um how Odin tries to kind of like regain control of the Valkyries by saying oh Brynhild oh I'm so sorry just stop causing mm-hmm. trouble and come back and join the forces you can be immortal again you can have your flying horse mm-hmm. and whatnot and Brynhild quite rightly says no <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you've kind of like you've ruined my afterlife and then afterlife before that and you've just you've, you're making too much mess because and I think that rereading again for this analysis that I'm doing and when Loki warns to kind of like do you realize how many millions of people will be drowning in their own blood before all this is over mm-hmm. and I thought that was a really good ominous kind of like undertone for what Odin is effectively doing he's just ramping up the wars ramping up the conflict all because mm-hmm. he's driven by that insane need to get warriors for Ragnarok so the Ragnarok doesn't happen so he doesn't die and of course getting mm-hmm. more knowledge to help in that whole inevitable fiasco which I absolutely love and the scene mm-hmm. of it is brilliant it reflects some of the kind of tales of our Kyries and how they mm-hmm. have forms or cloaks of sort that they can take off and just I love it's, I'm trying not mm-hmm. to stop the ending don't read it it's just so good <laughs> it's just so it's 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 like the cherry on the cake by the time you reach the ending mm-hmm. I find for me and oh, I just I just I just love it all I really do oh, yeah. um it's the yeah. kind of book that I dream of and like back when I was a young wanna be writer when I did creative writing at university it kind of died off afterwards because mm-hmm. procrastination in life and the lack of deadlines mm-hmm. and too many books to read I just had too mm-hmm. many distractions and no discipline <laughs> but I try to write yeah. about Valkyries myself <laughs> because I do find that there's so much unknown law about Valkyries and their role and how mm-hmm. they become one like we have 13 names in poetic header and they're all connected to battle mm-hmm. type tomes or words or verbs like um host fetter and battle climber and of course hilda meaning battle that kind of thing mm-hmm. um and i think it's just such a rich gap for authors to fill mm-hmm. their imagination because of course we've got no one telling us we're wrong <laughs> exactly, <laughs> um, which exactly. is which is which is the rich thing and of course because of that it yeah. allows it to be retold and adapted in so many different ways it's what's why it's why i found so many different books i have got more than just once so i've got ebooks as well which we felt carried in um and it's why i've found them so fascinating so I'd love to know more about how you kind of like find Valkyries in your own fascination, yeah. any retellings, any other experience encounters and why you think, I mean, even Marvel's brought along Valkyrie mm-hmm. as a woman and they made her a king. So, mm-hmm. so there we go. Yeah, yeah, no, that's wonder- so wonderful to hear. And I, I feel exactly the same way. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that I find 
really fascinating about it is is like you the um these little bits that that we have in in the Eddas and you know the the names of the Valkyries and the idea that there are probably these these stories you know behind them that maybe we've lost or um, that somebody might have known at one time uh, and so we don't have a lot but what we do have is so fascinating and and uh, the the poem where Brunhild um, I think she has a different name, but she's sort of associated mm -hmm. with Brunhild, where she does, uh, you know, teach uh, Sigurd the rune lore, uh, which, mm -hmm. as you say, I, I drew on in my book. Um, you know, it's so wonderful that there's this this female figure who is a, a warrior, and she's also the teacher. Uh, she teaches the hero, mm -hmm. you know, how to make sure he doesn't get poisoned by his ale and, and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And so, yeah, it's, it's just like you're saying, I think that these figures are really fascinating, and there's so much behind them that that is yet to be explored. Um, one of the things that uh, that I, that was in my mind when I was when I was writing this this big battle at the end and the um, um, the the context of the historical war that it's set in, um, you know the uh, as far as I know the, the the sort of final battles with Attila uh, were some of the bloodiest of all time. If you look at them sort of from a, a relativistic perspective of how many people died on the mm -hmm. battlefield and that kind of thing. And they, they were quite horrific. And um, that that concept of war, you know, uh, we have these stories that uh, are told from uh, from a culture that uh, very much did find glory in, in war and battle. Um, but also, you know, if we're looking at it today and probably at the time as well, there's there's the other side of that, right? If you have these these figures who are there to choose the slain on the battlefield, um, you know, there's a lot of horror in that, and there's a lot of mm -hmm. uh, questions that we could, that that raises for us today in in a in a time when is we're also you know witnessing mm -hmm. absolutely horrific wars and and death and uh, you know so I think th that in, that side of it of uh, as I sort of bring bring all that together, I think mm -hmm. that that's what fascinates me about the Valkyries is that there's um, uh, the multiple facets of them, because not only are they there to choose glory on the battlefield, um, but they are also teachers and healers and the keepers of mm. of rune lore, and um, and they have these wonderful um, personalities and stories and and all the rest of it. Um, so I think that there are many many different ways to explore that for sure. Mm. It's made me think again how much they almost reflect a slight weakness in Odin and his power because of course being a god you would think well okay you can go choose whoever you want to die and just get them yourself but no he has he needs Valkyries very much like the Christian god has angels I suppose um and other probably religions and pantheons have their own kind of like soul collectors and soul guides of course like in mm -hmm. Greece there's the boatman over the river Styx mm -hmm. I believe there's yeah. all these kind of like these entities that can go in between and I've always like yourself thought of Valkyries as must they must have been human before because mm -hmm. they they have that connection to us mm -hmm. on the mortal realm and most of the Valkyrie books I've read they certainly if not directly come from a human background but they definitely heavily involve themselves in human culture and society and events and drama and plot mm -hmm. thickens and all that kind of jazz um, a lot more than like the Norse gods do and um, I remember when I think it was in oh it was a podcast I did with the Orbit Viking the podcast I had Professor Caroline Larrington um author Joanne Harris and Francesca Simon and we we're talking about why the Norse gods have such a connection with modern society today and the point I said to them is that they're effectively human they just happen to have apples that make them live a lot longer <laughs> which is yeah, yeah. incredibly yeah. corny because doctors are always telling to eaters and they, like an apple a day keeps illness away and all that all that kind of thing because mm -hmm. they they display all the flaws of humanity they're not in, innately good but they're not innately bad they've all got problems like Odin isn't um the quite passive Odin of um Marvel Cinematic Universe although I will say when Hell came along it seemed he did have quite a war frenzy reign but then of mm -hmm. course he downturned it all and went very passive um mm -hmm. whereas Odin isn't that kind of god he's I, I think most Certainly from the historical fiction I've read, most of the warriors that kind of like beseech him when they're going to battle the berserkers because they do want to get that bloodlust, mm. that craze, that kind of like no fear at all and just kind of like daring and boldly going and doing things. 
and getting mm. bloody and crazy and just slaughtering many people. Whereas most of the sensible warriors kind of like worship Thor because of course Thor was more the god of the people than Odin was. Odin, of course, mm. was reflected more in the hierarchical society of the kings and the princes and the, maybe not the queens and, and that kind of thing. Um, mm. But I think you've also reflected that quite well with the Valkyries as well, especially when you describe how Valhalla is nice but it's unendingly nice and you do make the really point of like how there's no change and Brynhilda says like there's no consequences there's no risk we all die but then we all come back up again like we kill the boar and it comes back again we kill the boar and it comes back again like this is just like we can kill a boar 101 different ways and we'll still have 101 different days beyond that Uh um kind of thing I think that was a real good way of doing it um Again, so you had you mentioned Valkyries kind of like almost becoming bored of their own immortality, their own job. And mm-hmm. of course, Brunhild and Sigurd are the kind of like the infamous um not unrequited love, but kind of like tragic love, very much like love mm-hmm. Romeo and Juliet, kind of like the dangers of mm-hmm. a man falling in love with an immortal, well not quite immortal, but kind of like a woman mm-hmm. out of his league, so to speak, or and that whole mismatch with the disguise. You mm-hmm. mentioned through Brynhild, of course, but I know it's you. <laughs> um, kind of like she gives reference to other Valkyries deciding to also say, actually, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play dangerously. I'm, I'm gonna fall in love with that guy because he's quite nice. Mm-hmm. And actually, no, you're not gonna kill him, Brynhild. Just put your sword away, and I'll just mm-hmm. take him over here. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. love that little scene how she just like led him to the woods and then his hands and then he saw her and then his hands are all over and I'm like yeah yeah you probably would if you'd just been pulled off a battlefield and realised that <laughs> a beautiful woman had saved your life um, yeah. and of yeah, course it's... he of course has an ill fate he he does die in the end he gets murdered he doesn't get to go to Valhalla so that Valkyrie doesn't get to see him so she chooses to go and be with his ghost near his barrow which I thought mm-hmm. was a really fascinating touch because then that's almost two spiritual beings from mm-hmm. different planes and realms kind of like choosing to try and be together and defy the rules that usually separate them apart um mm-hmm. so yeah I think you explore mm-hmm. kind of like the relationships as both romantic and sexual through a whole a lot of these characters really kind of like openly well and nothing seems shocking it's all well they normally cost because mm-hmm. uh, uh, we're much more aware of how diverse love is in the 22nd mm-hmm. century and we do hope that they were at least aware of certain loves like that back in mm-hmm. the Viking age, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it is a really complex uh, set of stories, you know, and there's there's so much in it that, um, you know, and as, as you say, like Odin, uh, the, the old stories about Odin are, are quite complex and he's such an interesting figure and uh, not at all... Uh, you know, it, it always reminds me of the line from um, Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe where Aslan is mm. not a tame god, you know, that he's, mm. he's it, and Odin is very much like that, that he's he's not uh, predictable and he's not always kind, uh, certainly, mm. and he's, he's absolutely not um, assumed to be benevolent, uh, which is a little bit, uh, you know, uncomfortable, I think, for, for many modern readers, because the, mm-hmm. the concept of a god who is um, actually kind of a jerk a lot of the time is, mm-hmm. is uh, you know, not at all unusual for um, older mythologies, but but it's not something that uh, is sort of part of our daily life today. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I think one, you know, one interpretation that I should mention, because it's definitely been, uh, you know, hugely influential on me, uh, you know, I mentioned Neil Gaiman's Norse Myths early on, mm-hmm. but I think probably even more influential um, is American Gods uh, mm. and his version of Odin in that story, which I think is absolutely true to to the sort of classic interpretation of Odin, where he is not mm. to be trusted and and yeah. uh, you know he <laughs> he has his own agenda always, always has an mm. agenda. Um, and so that that version of Odin, I think, uh, was definitely really um, formative for me as well. Oh, well, I'm glad I found someone else who <laughs> thinks and knows kind of like the, the intricate depths and aspects of Odin kind of mm. thing. Um, mm. So, yeah, um, gosh. Oh, how long did it take you to write Brynhild? Well, Brynhild's story, The Valkyrie. Uh, it's hard to say because I have this habit of working on multiple things at once. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I have... 
uh, I keep my emails, you know, luckily, so mm-hmm. I can always go back and see when I when I first wrote to my agent about something. <laughs> <laughs> so when the year that I wrote to my agent and I said, oh, I want to write this story about uh, about Bird Hill and the Valkyrie uh, was 2018. Mm-hmm. So I was working on uh, on it from from then, and I think I was writing it from about 2018 to 2021, but I was working on other things at the same time. So mm-hmm. I was, you know, revising my novel, The Embroidered Book, and I had, um, I was also writing my Assassin's Creed novels. And mm-hmm. so often it'll be a, a case where I'll take three months to be drafting something and then I'll have to switch to edits on something else and then go back to drafting. And um, so I think overall it was probably about three or four years, um, but not exclusively working on that, mm-hmm. yeah. And how did you find the research level? Of course, as the Guardian brilliantly quotes on the front, it is a mm-hmm. sustains a fine balance between history and fantasy, which of course is beautifully put. Because as you said earlier in this, it is it has got touches of history in it. Attila mm-hmm. the Hun, it did exist. Yeah. This myth yeah. legend isn't making it up. Um, mm-hmm. It just happens that he also seems to it just has the mythological side thing. But as you said, kind of mm-hmm. like these myths get retold and to things. So how mm-hmm. did you kind of balance the research with the mythology aspect and of course the historical aspects and how did you find Mm -hmm. marrying the two together? Yeah um, I love the research part of it uh, you know and that's always probably one of the reasons why I keep going back to historical settings um, with my novels is that it's one of my favorite things to do is to Mm. research and to think about how to fit a story inside of history. Um, So um, yeah the mixing you know trying to figure out how am I going to tell the story and I did uh I spent a long time at the beginning thinking okay I'm going to tell this in a kind of um unnamed land like it's going to be you know Mm -hmm. sort of just just story land you know like these things are going to be happening but then the more I thought about it you know the more I read the source material which which is you know um at its root, it did it did come from this this story um, of of this people that were uh, attacked on uh, on the borders of the empire, and you know it's it's almost invisible there now in the story, but it's there, and um, and I didn't want to lose that. I, I felt like it was important to the story that there were there was a mm-hmm. historical happening, you know, just like the Iliad is the story of Troy, you know, like mm-hmm. so. So I, I yeah so I decided okay well I am going to ground this in history but then that gave me some challenges because I had to figure out how this would all fit together and then I had to research um, a little bit about what this part of the Roman Empire would have looked like in the fifth century and uh, that part was a was quite challenging because it's not um, you know it's it's not 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 to say that it hasn't been studied it's been studied but mm-hmm. there's not a lot of popular history about mm-hmm. the sort of Germanic um, you know, client and empi- client kingdoms mm. on this on the edges of the Roman Empire is not is not a subject of a lot of popular popular history that I found. So it's very, but you know, there's academic work, but it's it's not super accessible for uh, someone just trying to get a sense of what was happening. Mm. Um, but I love academic work, so I sort of dove into <laughs> journal articles and and uh, stories about the Burgundians and and anytime I can find uh, primary sources, that's always mm. the best. So. Um, things like the Burgundian legal code uh, still exists. We have it, and um, mm-hmm. I found a translation of that. And, and so, understanding their legal code helped me to understand what some of their norms and values would have been. And um, you know, things like how would they have eaten dinner? Would they have would they have reclined to eat dinner because they were uh-huh. part of the empire, or would they have had chairs? You know, and, and just like stuff like that. It was just <laughs> the amount of hours I spent thinking about whether or not they would recline or not to eat dinner. And eventually, I ended up deciding that they would do both. That they would have like a Roman dining room, and then mm. they would have their sort of Germanic dining mm. room, <laughs> depending on which guests they're entertaining. So yeah, so I really I I did get sort of deep into that stuff in, in terms of how can I make this feel grounded in real history. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I always kind of over-research. I do, a, <laughs> I do a lot of research. Well, it but. sounds like you enjoyed it, and I guess that's good, because it does definitely come through, like, the details, like, between how Gunnar has to effectively fight for his kingship, and it's his mm. uncle, I think, who picks Sigurd yeah. to be his champion, because he simply comes across him, and he's like, oh, he killed a dragon, can you just go defeat my nephew for me so I can yeah. well, I, I like that bit of politics because that was something that I wasn't really aware of because certainly in the saga of the Volsungs you don't get that kind of yeah. culture of the Brigandians coming through but you do mm-hmm. it really well in your book and the other question I was going to ask was 
The Saga of the Volsung certainly have the little titles for each of their chapters and sections, and I do quite like the titles for your chapters mm -hmm. and indeed, of course, your sections, because you've got about four four sections. So yeah. sort of like, did you did you struggle with any name in particular chapters, or did they come out quite naturally when you've finally segmented them off? Um, I think they came pretty naturally for this one. And one of the things I wanted to do with the chapter headings in this one was uh, just so subtly signal to the reader, mm. um, you know, who whose story we were looking at, because I do have to two first person mm. narrators. And I know that can be confusing for readers when you have I and the I are is mm. two different people. Um, and uh, so each of the chapter titles actually, you know, includes the name of the woman who is speaking. Although mm. there are a couple of times when it's like Gudrun talks to Brunhild or something, and then, <laughs> and then you have to, you know, really parse it to figure out. But but for the most part, it's like you know when Brunhild speaks to the birds or whatever, then you know, okay, mm. well this is a Brunhild chapter. Um, so it was just sort of a practical thing to, uh, you know, to clue in the reader a little bit. Although not everyone reads chapter titles or or uh, clues mm. in that way. Um, and the sections too, you know, just sort of the the stories seem to fall into um, particular uh, particular pieces that way, um, and it did give me a chance to kind of draw a little bit on the just pull out some of the imagery and uh, mm. you know just bring the reader into um, what I really wanted them to focus on in terms of of imagery and tone for those sections. Well, I really liked it, and of course, it made me think how the saga and the vol songs was written. But oh, she's copying it. But then, mm. of course, yes, uh, I unconsciously was uh, wasn't aware that there was actually also mm. telling me which character was speaking. Although mm. I am now because I'm rereading it and going to all the Brynhild ones. <laughs> uh, yeah, Although yeah, Gud yeah. Run Gudrun's kind of part is of also kind of like significant legal contribution because, as well as expanding Brynhild's ending beyond the Pyre scene, you've also expanded on Gudrun's ending. Because I'm not mm. quite sure. I can't specifically remember what happens to her as such after the burning of the pirate yeah. inside of the Vol songs, but I quite like yeah. where you took her, you kind of gave her her own kind of female independence and agency in different ways. Yeah, yeah, and that that was a tricky thing to decide because um, she, so that's one place where the Nibelungen lead um, actually departs quite a bit from from the Norse versions or vice versa, but they're, they're quite different in terms mm. of what Gudrun's um, the ending of her story is uh, so you know there are some versions of her story in which she takes uh, revenge on her own brother and mm -hmm. um, the men of 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 uh, what I call Vermatia or the city of Worms in in, um, in what is now Germany uh, so she actually turns on on her family and she goes off and marries Attila and mm -hmm. um, and uses that as a way to take revenge. And then there's other versions of the story where she revenges herself on Attila mm. and burns down uh, Attila's camp and, and kills him, which is probably inspired by the historical event, which is Attila, his death possibly happened at uh, his, one of his wedding feasts and he married this new wife and she may or may not have poisoned him. Mm. Uh, her name was Ildiko. And so that may have been the uh, inspiration for the sort of um, Gudrun Kriemhild character taking refuge, mm. and taking revenge on him. And, and I have a little reference to that in the book as well. Mm. So I won't talk about which version I have in, in my story, <laughs> but there are these long, and there are the, some of this, some of the versions also include um, uh, like, you know, long other, other storylines long after this of what happens with Brynhild and, and Gudrun and um, you know there's a, a Svanhild who is another mm -hmm. girl who comes into it later on and um, so that was I felt very much like there were several different possibilities I could do when it came to the ending and um, uh, you know we yeah the, the sort of big moment on the pyre and and the choice of um, you know who pays for uh, the death of the hero in some sense mm. uh, it feels like a big climax but there are other things that then happen and, and the way that that story plays out um, so yeah I feel very much like it, it could be a bit of a choose your own adventure <laughs> <laughs> at the end you know and, but I wanted them to have a particular kind of ending which uh, mm. you know um, I wanted this to be in the end about these two women so that's that's sort of what drew me back to deciding how I was going to end this novel. Mm. Well I 
really salute it and I salute you for your research, your writing, your talent and your clear passion for this. It comes through and of course they do have a happy ending of sorts at the end, but mm -hmm. it just, it's, of course, Grunhild and Brynhild are two women kind of like in this male dominated world, both divine with Odin and of course politically with Gunnar and the rivals of power and of course it's the Hun and war and it, they really do stretch and push themselves to try and stand on their own two feet and find their own purpose and their own path regardless of what everyone else says and I think that mm -hmm. really of course speaks to so many women around the world trying to break through the patriarchal circle that dominates still a lot of society and from business to parenting <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not going to go on that one um so mm -hmm. yes <laughs> but yeah. I really really enjoyed it and I do highly recommend that anyone in slight interest in Norse mythology or just wanting a really good feminist empowering story with a really lovely twist should do definitely go bye oh, it's so beautiful <laughs> it's wonderful because it, it's so it's so lovely to, to talk to you because you know when you're in the middle of writing a book like this um you know, and you get into the, the middle sections when it just feels you get despair and you think, why did I ever start this? You know, I don't have, I can't finish it. I'm just, you know, this was a mistake from start to finish. Uh, and there's always that moment where you just feel like total despair. Um, but I think what, what drives you forward as a writer is knowing that somewhere out there is a reader who is going to get it and is going to um, connect with it in some way. And so talking to you and knowing, well, you are that you are that <laughs> ideal reader because you know you have the background and you you get it on so many levels. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a real it's a real joy to to talk to you. Oh well, thank you. I mean, I don't have the courage, not the time, nor the energy, and definitely not the imagination to write anything as beautiful and as good. But I'm just grateful that there are women like you that do. And it's funny how a lot of the books actually that I read about Valkyries are written by women. A lot of the Norse mm -hmm. fantasy I read generally is written by women, apart from Neil mm -hmm. Gaiman and Snorri Christiansen. I think there's really only a couple of men actually on my shelf. It's nearly all women and predominantly white mm -hmm. Western women, of course, which is another mm -hmm. angle. I've always been curious about how the Norse, both in mythological and definitely the historical sense, is very much definitely kind of like a Western white hemisphere. There's not much interest mm -hmm. or connection with kind of the wider global citizenship um from the southern or far east kind of thing um mm -hmm. although getting into norse mythology and anime is a definite different topic for a different episode entirely mm -hmm. um but yes so thank you so much i am all out of questions because otherwise i'm just going to keep complimenting you and all oh, this and that and I'll, I'll give away <laughs> too much too many spoilers too many spoilers um but i really appreciate your time joining my humble little youtube channel in my wonderful little series called valhalla conversations and it, it really is it's a conversation in valhalla for me to be able to speak to wonderful creatives with equal passion and interest and as i say like madness that we both share so thank you very yeah, much kate well, thank you. And I knew that when you asked me earlier on, I would that something would would trigger in my mind that I would want to recommend a retelling, mm -hmm. and it did finally just before the end. <laughs> so I definitely want to recommend um, my friend Chadwick Ginther's books, uh, the Thunder Road trilogy, which is um, Norse mythology that is reinterpreted and reimagined in modern Manitoba, which is where Ooh. I grew up and has um, a strong Icelandic uh, community. Um, so definitely check out Chadwick Ginther's books. I'll oh, really? Well, do ping me along your details and I'll make sure they will be in the notes below this video, dear viewers. So, of course, I promote and support all Norse, all Norse, anything Viking. I, it usually gets my money mm -hmm. and my name shouting about it somewhere. So. <laughs> yes. So, but thank you so Absolutely. much for joining me. I, it's been a real privilege and honour and a real pleasure to talk about all this with you. And, of course, I wish you best of luck with all your future writing projects. Thank you. Likewise. <laughs>